All righty. So today, we talked a little bit about these. We kind of named the factors that were going to affect plant growth yesterday before we started talking about the plant hormones and all of that. Okay, uh, But today, we want to look at them in particular and see what effect do they generally have on a plant because some of the stuff that you're going to get tested on or asked about is going to be, all right, a plant is exposed to this situation and it'll describe some factors within the plant's environment that are going to change. And then you're going to have to talk about how the plant will respond to that using what we learned yesterday. So, you know, this, uh, maybe this tropism will happen or the plant will have to secrete more of this hormone because this hormone does this. But in order to answer that question properly, we have to know what effect do all the factors in a plant's environment have on it so that we know how it might respond to that and then we can formulate a proper answer. Okay, does everyone kind of follow what I'm saying there? All right, because biology is a lot of two kinds of questions. Strict recall, Okay, so you memorize it and regurgitate it onto the piece of paper on the exam. Okay, and the second kind is apply. Okay, apply what you know. So here's a novel situation that we maybe haven't talked about, but you have enough background knowledge that you can uh, extrapolate from what you know to answer that question. Okay, it's basically those two kinds of questions in biology, right? And obviously, um, the latter part, the apply your knowledge and, and things like that, is the kind that results in you having to think a lot more. All right, so we're going to look at the components or factors that affect plant growth and understand, obviously, how they do it. Okay, so we got to look at ecosystem structure. Okay, within an ecosystem, there are two kinds or two groups of factors. There are abiotic factors, which are all the non-living parts of an ecosystem that can affect the plant. And then there are the biotic components. That would be all the living things in the plant's environment that can affect the plant. Okay. Most of the time, we think more about the abiotic factors within the environment, okay? Because biotic factors tend to be things like predation and competition, okay? There's really only kind of two things there, okay? But with abiotic components, there are a lot more of them, okay? There's a lot more non-living parts of an ecosystem that can affect a plant's growth. So if we're looking at this ecosystem here, okay, um, obviously there's food chains going on, okay? So part of that is, you know, the biotic factor of your predator, this gopher. Okay, so if you're a plant, that's your predator, okay, and, and it's going to affect your growth by eating you, and then you'll have to grow back, okay. Other things, the amount of precipitation or water that is available, okay, the amount of water in the soil, or maybe the structure of the soil would be another one, okay. Does, is all dirt the same? Okay, if you thought all dirt was the same, I'm telling you, it's not all the same, okay. All dirt is very, very different, uh, and I didn't really... Realized that until I started working at a golf course and then in university I took geology courses and then boy Dirt is different everywhere. Okay, you really learn that when you take that geology Okay, is that yeah, there's all different kinds of dirt and all kinds of dirt have different abilities to affect plant growth um, Soils that are really rocky can't hold water Okay, why not? Right if it's full of rocks, there's not really a lot of spaces or porous or spongy material in the soil that can actually absorb water and hold onto it. The same is true for sandy soils, right? If you've ever seen like, you know, when the waves wash up on the beach, you know, the, the water sits on top and then all of a sudden just down into the, into the sand and it's gone, okay? Because there's big spaces between the particles of sand, big spaces between the particles and rocks. But water can also, it can, it can go into those spaces, but it can also evaporate out of them very, very quickly. Whereas if you have a soil that's made of smaller particles, it has a better ability to retain the water because it's more likely to have the spaces between sealed off from the outside, right? So if we're looking at stuff like loam, for example, which would be full of things like peat and, and or lots of organic material and things like that, it tends to be pretty spongy and it can hold on to water very well. Okay. Um, if you're looking at something like clay, clay has incredibly small soil particles. And so, I mean, you've all felt sand between your fingers, right? It feels gritty. Sand has big particles. If you feel clay between your fingers, clay when it's dry, it feels like flour, okay, or baking soda between your fingers. It's incredibly fine, right? And as a result, there's very small spaces between the particles because the particles themselves are very small and they fit tightly together and clay holds on to moisture really, really well. In fact, 
sometimes so well that plants can't grow in it because it won't release the water to the plants. It holds onto it so tightly. Okay, so the structure of a soil really determines the amount of water and thus the amount of plants, the amount of nutrients that are available there. Okay, what would be the kind of soil we have here? What, what would it have a lot of? Clay, loam, sand, maybe mixture? What do you think would be the bulk of it? Whatever you see in like belly and stuff, you like, or they make like, like dirt, and there's just like clay and rocks. Right, yeah, there's clay and rocks underneath. And that's typical of all soil structures. You're going to have the organic material on the top because that's where plants have grown and died and, and they decompose and they kind of build up that loamy topsoil that's very black, right? We saw that when they were digging up over there. I think actually you can still kind of see the piles there. Okay, they make a topsoil pile because that's what those first, that first group of, of machines that were there, those scrapers, okay, they scrape all the topsoil off and they pile it off to the side. Okay, and then companies like, you know, Dirt Cheap and things like that, they, they actually have contracts to take some of it away and then they can sell it back to you later. Okay, you only get a little bit back on your lot. You'll learn that when you buy a house, it's really kind of a ripoff, but okay. Um, the other stuff that's down below that is typically more clay, but it also has some rock in it because where does all soil come from? Rocks, rocks. yeah. Soil is broken down rock. Okay, that's what it is. As rock slowly erodes and breaks and, and weathers, the pieces of it that break off collect and form soil. So the type of rock in an area determines how your soil is going to look and what structure it's going to have. What kind of rocks do we have around here? Yep. Okay. Primarily around here, our bedrock is sandstone. Okay. Uh, so it's made of mostly cemented sand. Yeah. So typically our soils around here tend to be a little lighter brown and sandier, grittier. Okay, so they hold they hold moisture pretty well, but they also release it if they're exposed to the sun for a while without any precipitation. Okay, but it gives them some loose structure, which is why they're good for growing crops in the roots. Uh, the roots of plants are able to easily penetrate the soil, get deep, and have access to water. Okay, in more clayish soils, it's harder to get root penetration. The, the soil holds on to moisture harder, okay, and and it's tougher for plants to grow. If you go further north, where you start to get more into like a limestone type of soil. Okay, then it's typically darker in color. It's more loamy, finer particles. Okay, uh, tends to be a little bit more fertile than than does sandstone-based um, based soil. So we're definitely sandstone around here. I know when they dug the hole for my house, they hit the bedrock about two feet down, and they actually had to bring in like a jackhammer and break up big pieces of sandstone in order to get the hole for my foundation. Okay, they actually pulled two big rocks that were like the size of a Honda Civic out of the hole okay and that was the whole neighborhood was that way it was built right on the bedrock because there was an outcropping of sandstone right where they were building all the houses and so it was really strange to see all these big rocks everywhere um yeah so definitely lots of sandstone in this area okay everybody with me there okay so the structure of the rocks influences the structure of the soil influences what the plants have to work with amount of sunlight okay Around here, do we get a fair amount of sun? Well, actually we do. I mean, if you look at the number of days with sunlight here in Alberta, it's pretty high, okay? It's like 300 or something like that, or 290 something. It's a lot of days of sunlight. Okay, if you go to like Vancouver or Victoria, they're almost the exact opposite, okay? They get like 45 or 50 days of, of sun and the rest of the days is kind of overcast, okay? Um, so we get you know a fair amount of direct sunlight, but does the amount of sunlight change? Yeah, yeah, day length changes, and that's something that certainly factors in for plants because it affects temperature, which is another factor that affects plant growth. So there's all kinds of these abiotic components that we don't even always really think about that can affect the growth of a plant. All right, so yesterday we listed a couple of them. Okay, Temperature was one of them. It's an important factor because of its effect on biological processes. Okay, In other words, metabolism. Okay, And the inability of most organisms to regulate body temperature precisely. That is, plants cannot regulate their body temperature. Right? They're not like a mammal okay, that has the ability to, at least within a range of temperatures, regulate its body temperature. Okay. Plants are affected. If temperatures become too hot, they lose too much water and they have to shut down and not carry out photosynthesis. Or when they become too cold, ice crystals can form in their cells and enzymes will break down. Okay. All right. And then obviously water. 
Water is essential to life, but its availability varies drastically. In some places, there's too much of it. In other places, there's not enough. And in some places, it's just right. Okay, it's the Goldilocks idea. Okay, of of water. Okay, you got to be in the area that's just right. All right, or you have to adapt to what you have and make it just right. Right, there are some plants around here that would not survive in wetter areas. Right, we saw that when we had all the all the rain and all the flooding there in. in 2013, a lot of plants that normally survive well here, okay, but were in low-lying areas, died because their soil was saturated for too long. Okay. Why does that kill a plant? Yeah, their roots suffocate. Okay. They essentially drown because their roots are surrounded by water and the roots have to absorb oxygen in order to carry out cellular respiration. Plants can't transport oxygen from one place to another. They can't transport carbon dioxide from one place to another either. Okay? They don't have a circulatory system, so if their roots are submerged, they'll, the roots will suffocate, okay? and then the plant will die. All right. Um, does water quality affect plants? Yeah, it does, Okay, for sure. I mean, around here, we're, we're very fortunate. Okay? We have the greatest resource in the hugest amount possible, and that is lots and lots of very fresh water. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean you can walk up to any stream in, in Canada and drink directly from it. That is crazy. Okay. Do not do that, regardless of how clean the water looks. Okay. There are going to be microscopic things in there that can make you sick unless you are right at the glacier. Okay. You should not do that. And even then, it's not all that, a good, it's not all, all that good of an idea. Okay. So water quality is certainly going to affect it. If water has been stagnant and sitting around for a while, it might start to become a little bit saline or a little alkaline or a little acidic. And you know that's maybe not going to be great for, for organisms or plants that are growing in that area. And obviously, salt water is, is salty. That's no good either. And we see that oftentimes after a hurricane, if there's been a storm surge okay, and a lot of salt water has inundated a coastal area, okay, most of those plants are adapted to deal with that, but they do suffer and they don't grow very well for a while until that salt has been washed away. Okay, sunlight provides energy for nearly all ecosystems, although only plants and other photosynthetic organisms use its energy directly. And we did say that changing light levels can affect changes in an organism. Like yesterday, we said that it could cause a plant to release what hormone? Abscistic acid, right? Abscistic acid will cause the plant to go dormant because it'll disrupt the production of chlorophyll. Okay, I had a question like that on last year's unit exam, actually. Okay, I showed a picture of a few plants in winter and said, "Hey, what's going on here?" Okay, people had to apply their knowledge, and and that's kind of the example like I gave you earlier. Okay, so light, uh, light influences the behavior of plants as well as animals. Length of day is the single best indicator for cueing seasonal changes. Okay. And we see that obviously in plants, but we see it in animals as well. Okay. Uh, the mating cycle of many animals is based on length of day. All right. It's also based on their gestation period. That is how long will the animal be pregnant okay. or when will it lay its eggs or whatever. Okay. But animals do have a sense of when they need to do certain things. Um, for gophers, for example, okay, the gophers don't stay pregnant very long, but they want to have their young when? Yeah, early spring, actually. They want to have them in very early spring. Because when they're small, they still have to nurse, right? So they're, they're going to be nursing from the mother until they're a certain age. And then usually by kind of late March, early, early April, they're mature enough that they can go out on their own and start looking for seeds and grass and, and things like that that will be starting to grow around that time. If you're a gopher and you have your babies in December, they're going to die. It's as simple as that. Okay, because you're only going to be able to nurse them for so long before you yourself run out of energy okay, and you starve. And then, of course, they don't make it because there's no food around in February, okay, unless you've stored a ton of seeds, which gophers usually do. But okay, uh, there's, you're going to run out. Okay? So you have to time when your babies are going to be born so that they'll have the best chance at survival. Now, for coyotes, coyotes want to have their babies a little bit later because what do coyotes eat? Gophers. So you want to make sure there's lots of little baby gophers who aren't too bright running around so that there's something to eat okay, and something to catch. So everything is kind of based on length of day. The gophers have theirs here. The, the, you know, the, uh, the mating cycle of coyotes will be offset by a little bit longer. So the days have to be a little shorter before the, 
they're in the mood, okay, and and things like that. For fish, fish spawn at certain times. That's based on water temperature, which is usually based on length of day, okay, things like that. Uh, aquatic plants are much different. They don't have root systems, uh, and because the ocean is so big, there's always oxygen available that they can absorb directly because they don't have a cuticle. Oh, they're they're much more adapted to yeah differing saline con concentrations. I mean. Animals that live in the ocean are so different from terrestrial animals or animals that live in freshwater, and plants are the same. Yeah, there's a real um, salt balance that has to be achieved, which is why you see way more mammals living on land than you do living in the ocean. I mean, partly it's breathing, but also it's partly salt balance. They have to have a way different kidney than do a freshwater animal. Yeah. Why is a whale a mammal? Uh, because they nurse their young. They can produce milk. They can re regulate their body temperature, and they give birth to live young that they nurse with milk. I don't really see how like, that would make them a mammal. I mean, they look like a fish. They live in the sea. Yeah, but fish have gills. gills. Mammals or uh, whales don't. Whales have lungs. That's why they have to come up surface and breathe. Fish never have to surface, right? Fish have gills. Uh, fish also don't give birth to live young. Okay, they uh, they release their eggs into the ocean and then fertilize them externally. Fertilization is internal for all mammals. Okay, so yeah, there's there's all kinds of qualifications. Presence of hair, believe it or not, uh, whales actually do have hair. Okay, like not like we do, but okay, small amounts. Um, and the big, but the big thing for all mammals is the possession of mammary glands. That is, they can produce milk to feed their young. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So length of day big is a big deal. Amount of sunlight obviously powers photosynthesis. Okay, wind. This is one we didn't talk about the other day. It wasn't a factor that we listed, but wind is a huge factor for plants because it increases the rate of evaporation. If it's blowing hard, then things evaporate faster because you've always got dry air moving across the water. Okay, It's going to make it evaporate more quickly. <clears throat> it also causes wind chill. Okay, we're going to start uh, hearing that now pretty soon because it's almost November. Uh, you know, where you go outside, it's like, well, you look out the window and it looks sunny and beautiful out there. Right, and you walk out the door, it's minus 30, it's blowing a gale, and it feels like it's minus 50. Okay, well, that's because as wind blows across your skin and water evaporates, okay, you lose energy because it takes energy to evaporate water. So, as you lose moisture to the wind, you actually get colder. Okay, wind chill is how much, how much colder does it make it feel because of water loss and evaporation? Okay, um, now wind can also influence the structure of a plant. That is how it grows. Okay? Around here, our winds almost always come from the southwest. So trees are actually tend to be a little bit bent in that direction. Not as much here as if you go down to Lethbridge. Okay? If you go down to Lethbridge, trees are all curled to the northeast. Because okay? the wind is always blowing from the southwest. And they just tend to lean that way a little bit. Okay? Because they're always getting pushed. And they always grow more leaves on the other side because they're less likely to get broken off. Okay? You can actually see that with these spruce trees here. Okay? This whole side of this spruce tree is completely bare. Because the wind always blows from this direction. It blows into it on that side. Okay? And that would strip off any branches or leaves or needles or whatever that it tried to grow on that side. So... A lot of trees that grow near the tree line and are exposed will grow in this form, which is called the crummels form. Okay? And essentially, if you look down on that tree from above, this is the trunk. Okay? What you see is that you only have branches growing in this area over here. That way, the trunk provides a windbreak. As the wind hits the trunk, it gets deflected around the trunk, and all the branches on that side of the trunk are essentially protected from the wind. Okay? And it grows, and they kind of bend, kind of like this. So a, a tree that's growing in crummels form will grow like this. And all its branches will be underneath and on the leeward side, not the windward side. Okay? This this is something else you learn in geology. Windward and leeward. Okay. Everyone follow there? Okay. So wind can really affect the shape of many plants, especially, I mean, if you ever go hiking in Kananaskis, you get up near the tree line, you're going to see like Douglas fir and, and things like that that grow in this crumbles form. Okay. Questions on the effect of wind. All right. Rocks and soil. Physical structure, 
pH, okay, some soils are more acidic or more basic than others. Typically, uh, limestone soils tend to be a little bit more basic. Okay. Um, soils that come from more like volcanic rock or that contain more ash tend to be a bit more acidic, okay, things like that. Uh, rocks that are, or sorry, soils that tend to be flooded often, like, like uh, tropical rainforest soils also tend to be very acidic because they're anaerobic, okay? that is they're deprived of oxygen. Okay, so mineral composition of rocks and soil limit the distribution of plants and animals that feed on them. The availability or abundance of soil nutrients greatly influences that type of plants. So in this picture here, I put my trowel in the ground. Okay, I kind of cleared away a little bit of dirt or a little bit of the rock so you could see the soil that was underneath. But is there a lot of rock here? Okay, and what do you notice about the soil? There's some rocks in it, but I mean, it's it's like fairly loamy, it's fairly loose, okay? So it's easy to get roots in, okay? But that's how deep it is. I actually had to put a rock behind that trowel to hold it up, because when I tried to jam it into the ground to get it to stand, I couldn't, okay? Because I kept hitting what? Rocks, okay? This soil is incredibly thin, which is why you don't see any what? No trees. This is above the tree line in the mountains, okay? There's a reason there's a line where the trees stop. It's based on essentially temperature and soil structure. Okay, if there's low temperatures, you don't get a lot of um, buildup of soil. Plus, it tends to be very high up, and any water that gets there tends to run off. And what does it carry with it? It's the nutrients in the soil too. Okay, all the weathered rocks and things like that. The soil particles wash down into the lower reaches, okay, and collect lower down, and that makes richer soil further down the mountains. Right, so we get kind of nutrient poor okay, and very thin types of soils. So the growing season for plants that would grow here would be pretty short. Right? That stuff's going to be frozen solid okay, by probably mid-October. Right? And it's probably not going to thaw completely until well into May, maybe even early June. Right? So very short growing season. The advantage, though, during that growing season, how long are the days? Really long. Okay, so you, you get you got to get your growing in quickly, right? Uh, the only worry there would be that with all that direct sunlight, how quickly are you going to lose the small amount of water that could be held by that very thin soil? Okay, periodic disturbances, another one we didn't list yesterday. Okay, but there are periodic disturbances that happen in ecosystems, and when they happen, they change the distribution and availability of resources. Okay, here in Canada, one of those periodic disturbances is fire. Does it mean fire is bad? No. Was fire bad this year? Yes. Okay, I don't think anyone would argue that. And there was a lot of destruction and loss of property and things like that. But in terms of what it does for a natural ecosystem, fire is important. Because the only reason a fire happens is because there's a lot of what sitting around? Dry, dead wood. Okay, there's fuel sitting around because the plant, there hasn't been a fire there for a very long time. The plants have grown, aged, died, fallen down, decomposed, whatever, or partially decomposed. There's just a lot of stuff that needs to be renewed. Okay, well, we talked about the other day how a lot of tree species have their seeds that can't be released until they've been burned, right? Heated, those pine cones open up and release the seeds. That, in that case, fire is necessary. Okay. And and uh, unfortunately for us, um, like we made we made mistakes for about a hundred years in terms of how we managed fires, okay. especially in the national parks. We managed fires incredibly wrong. We put them out every time they happened. Okay, we made all these efforts. Put them out. Put them out. We can't let the forest burn. Ever, no one will come and look at the national parks if there's a big forest fire. Well. All we did was continue to pile on fuel. Every time we put out a fire, we left the fuel that was available there, okay? and we let more of it pile on until eventually there's so much that we can't put out the fire once it gets going. Okay? That's what happened up north, and it's not because we actively put out fires. It was just a perfect storm this year. Okay? Hot, dry winter, okay? hot, dry spring, and you know. Um, but in the national parks, it was strictly mismanagement. And in 2000 and what was it, 2003. In 2003, there was a huge fire that ripped through okay, Jasper National Park and destroyed tons of it. Right? And it was because for so long they'd been putting out fires and there was just all this dead wood sitting around. 
which in and of itself looked kind of ugly. Okay, but once the fire went through, now in another 50 to 100 years, you know, that forest will look perfectly normal. And you can sometimes see on mountainsides where a fire has happened. Okay, because there'll be different trees growing. There'll be one kind of trees, and it'll be kind of like a, almost a distinct border, and then there'll be older trees right next to it. That's because you know, the fire died or whatever at that point and didn't go any further. Okay? And the trees that grew in place of them were different kind of trees. Okay? They're younger, different species, things like that. Okay? So periodic disturbances are important. Fire is good because it, it can rejuvenate things. And with these trees dead, now what gets all the way down to the ground? Well, there's going to be some nutrients because ash is usually full of nutrients, but also more sunlight is going to penetrate through because now... The foliage is gone. It's been burned off. Okay, these trees will provide some cover, but not obliterating shade. Okay, so the young saplings will have a chance to grow in a protected environment, and eventually these will blow down. Okay, and and those other trees will grow up in their place. Okay, uh, so it's important there because it redistributed the resources. It said, all right, now there's more sunlight available at ground level. Okay, that also means it's possible the ground's going to dry out a little quicker because there's not as much shade. It's changing the availability of water a little bit, okay? things like that. But it definitely changed where the resources were located and how available they were to other organisms. Um, a hurricane can do the same thing. Okay? A flood, similar. Okay? All along the floodplains of all of our rivers around this area now, okay, they're much more fertile as a result of the floods. Because what got washed out of the rivers? nutrients, silts, okay, soil. We built up a whole bunch of stuff because all that crap that was being carried in the rivers when they flooded got deposited on the floodplains as the floodwaters receded. Okay? And so now what that's done is essentially replenished the riverine kind of wetlands that, that are, exist beside rivers. Okay? For a long time before that, they'd kind of begun to suffer. Um, a tornado would be another one, okay, because the tornado can blow down old growth trees and, and uh, make more light and things like that available uh, to other plants. Um, a volcanic eruption. A again, it's going to depend on the type, though. Um, if it's like Mount St. Helens, for example, where it's a pyroclastic eruption, where it's mostly ash and hot gases and things like that, and not a lot of liquid rock pouring out, okay, um, in the short term, Yes, everything is essentially sterilized, but long term, that ash is going to make good soil. If you look over in Europe and like Italy and places like that, they have really good soil around all those volcanoes that erupted, you know, thousands of years ago and deposited all those nutrients. If we're talking about in Hawaii, for example, where eruptions are different, eruptions result in outpourings of, you know, molten lava, that's going to take a little longer. Okay. It's certainly changing the availability of resources because it's encasing them all in, molt in solid rock after it cools. It's going to take a long time for that to become soil, but it's still changing the availability of resources. Okay. Everyone follow there? Okay. So some disturbances are a little quicker to recover from than others, but all disturbances change the availability of resources. Okay, biotic components, the living things. Interactions of all of those factors, okay, are what make an ecosystem what it is, okay? Whether it's good for growth, bad for growth, or what kind of plants can grow there, whatever, okay? But things that we don't often think about are what we would consider to be the decomposing organisms, okay? The ones that help to cycle the nutrients of dead material, okay? So your uh, rover beetles and your slugs and your millipedes and your earthworms and all the little uh, tiny arthropods that live in the in the dirt, okay, the sow bugs and, and mites and, and things like that that all kind of turn the soil and, and eat decaying material. Fungi, okay, they're, they're obviously helping to decompose things. Soil bacteria, all of that stuff that we never even think about are all helping to get the nutrients back into the soil where they can kind of start the cycle again, become used by plants, become food for animals and so on. Okay. Um, so some of those are a little more obvious in their effects. Like how many people have ever like seen carpenter ants eating a tree? Okay, like they can they can work on a tree in pretty short order. They're almost as bad as termites. Okay, um, incidentally, if you're ever cutting down trees because they're dead, always look first to see if they're full of carpenter ants. Because if you don't and you cut the tree down, 
they're going to get you. Okay? That happened to me when I worked at the golf course. I was cutting down this tree, and it was full of carpenter ants, and I didn't know it. And this chainsaw hit the nest right in the middle of the tree. Okay? Where does the chainsaw throw all of the sawdust? Right back at you. Right? When you're chainsawing, it throws it, especially if you've got to lay it on its side. When you're cutting it on a big tree, you've got to lay it on its side, and it sprays it pretty much right back on you. Okay? And uh, it sprayed a whole bunch of carpenter ants right out at me and the guy who was helping me. And yeah, they bite really hard. And when there's lots of them, it's really painful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, because you just spit them out, right? Like they're coming out with the sawdust, and it just blows them out. And it was... Yeah, the, I still, my skin just crawls when I think about it, but yeah. Okay. Um, always make sure that a tree, if it's start, if it's dead for it's dead for a reason. Make sure it isn't full of decomposing organisms that bite hard. How do you check? Uh, usually, you can just kind of pound on the tree if it's kind of weak and rotten. Okay. You might just want to try pushing it over, and then also look because they'll be crawling all over it. Right. So kind of check the tree and see if they're crawling on it. Okay. If there's a lot of them crawling on it, you might want to use an axe as opposed to a chainsaw. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, now, this stuff isn't in your notes, but it's it's stuff that we're just going to talk about here because there's a little bit more detail on how the water is taken up by the plants and things like that. Okay. So this is a cross section of a root. Okay. So it's kind of cut. So we're looking in at the root here. Yeah, you got the epidermis okay, on the outside protecting it. And you got the vascular cylinder here. Okay. The vascular cylinder is going to contain okay uh, some phloem okay and notice that in the root the phloem is not right on the outside right because it's got to supply all the cells of the root with sugar okay and then inside here you would have like your xylem okay that would be transporting the water being absorbed through okay into the into the root the outside is just the uh, out here this is the cortex essentially it's just the part of the root that sets up that osmotic pressure that pulls the water in all right, uh, so most of the uh, water and minerals occurs near the tips. Okay, If you're looking at like a big old growth tree and it's got a big, thick tree root, that root isn't absorbing any moisture anymore. That root was at one time when the tree was small, but it's enlarged to secondary growth as the plant has gotten bigger, and now it's mostly for anchoring. Most of the absorption occurs at the tips where the roots are small. Okay, um, So if you're looking at a cross-section of a root, it would be these root hairs that are doing the bulk of the absorption. This is more... Um, transporting it All right there's a couple of roots that water can take when it gets when it's getting into the roots okay there's the uh, apoplastic route and there's the symplastic route okay so the apoplastic route goes between the cells the symplastic route goes through the cells which one would take longer through the cells going to take longer. The advantage of the symplastic root, the one that goes through the cells, is obviously how many cell membranes has this water gotten through? Lots. What is the cell membrane probably doing to that water? Filtering it, cleaning it, making sure it's okay. Okay. But if a plant is stressed and suddenly water is available, it's going this way. Okay. It's taking the ring road okay, and not going through the city and it is going to get uh, in a lot quicker, but at the same time, it's moving through what we call the interstitial fluid. That's the fluid between cells, and it isn't getting cleaned as much, right? So um, when a plant is really stressed and takes up water quickly, it's also quite likely that it could be uh, taking in things that maybe aren't good for it. Well, if it's a plant, I mean, there still could be like the cell walls being lignified if it's like the woody part of the plant. Um, but mostly it's just tissue on other tissues, right? We say interstitial fluid, but it's not like they're floating loosely. It's, they're still, you know, fairly tight, but there's fluid in between. So it's hard to explain. That's a good question. Um, I mean, you've got your cytoskeletons. There's going to be attachments between cells because of the cytoskeleton, but enough flex that there can still be space. Okay. Um, I think we can talk about that one or that one. Okay, two groups that plants can essentially fit into. Okay, the plants that can tolerate flooding and the plants that can tolerate drought. Right? I mean, there's some plants in between, but generally there's two character, two different types. Hydrophytes or hydrophiles love or hate water. Yeah, the prefix "file" means loving. 
I know what you're thinking. That's exactly where that word comes from. Okay. Some of you are giving me a blank look, but that's okay. Okay. If you are a hydrophile, you love water. Okay. If you are an audiophile, you love sound and music. Okay. If you're that other thing you were thinking of, you're, yeah. Okay. Um, now, for these plants, now you're all getting it. Okay. Um, if you're a, a hydrophyte or a hydrophile, okay, you have to have a way to supply your roots with oxygen because they're going to be underwater for a lot of the time. So typically your plants in the tropical rainforest are gonna be hydrophytes or hydrophiles. And what they typically have is two different kinds of roots. They have anchoring roots, okay, which are these ones you can see here. They were actually exposed because there was a big flood that washed a lot of the soil away. <clears throat> so these roots can absorb water, but they also anchor the plant, okay? And there's lots of them there um, because obviously there's a lot of rain and flooding and they have to be well anchored, okay? Then there are these ones up above, okay? And the guy that uh, was, showing me this stuff was telling me that they call them snorkel roots, which is an appropriate name. What they allow, what they do is they absorb oxygen and pass it to the roots through diffusion, okay? Or through, um, through, through the uh, sap and stuff down to the smaller roots so it can absorb and go down that way. They're quite tall. I couldn't stand beside them because I was taking the picture, but okay. If I was standing beside them, they would be taller than me, okay? They were anywhere from six and a half to seven feet above ground level, which means they're most of the time above the flood water. And as a result, they can absorb oxygen and supply it to the roots below. Okay? And then they can survive being flooded for long periods of time. Okay? Other plants um, that have adapted to that, make sure that their leaves float. Okay? So they may have roots that are attached down below the water, okay? but their, their leaves float on the top okay? and they're able to um, to survive that way. They usually grow in fairly shallow water that is well oxygenated and, and the roots are adapted to that because they're more of an aquatic plant than a terrestrial plant, okay? Um, yeah, so hydrophytes have to be able to survive that, okay? If you're a zero fight, you love it arid, okay? You love it dry and you can tolerate long periods of drought, possibly months, okay, without any water. The structure of these plants is considerably different. Okay, they may not have any leaves at all anymore, or those leaves would be modified to be thorns, like a cactus. Okay, or okay, they could be like these ones here, okay, which are like a succulent. Okay, that means that their leaves have become uh, very, very broad and almost not even leaf-like anymore. Um, that's where that C uh, C4 leaf we looked at the other day comes from. Okay, kind of looks more like this stuff. Um, thick, thick cuticles, okay? Stomates kind of located everywhere, but very small, very few, and they got four guard cells instead of two, okay? Much different adaptations. So the ones we looked at were the problematic? No, the ones we looked at were C3 leaves, normal leaves. C4 leaves were like cacti. I, sh I showed you, sorry, in class, I showed you that diagram and said, I'm never gonna test you on it, and I'm still not, okay? But that's kind of what they look like on the outside. Not really a true leaf, but a lot more tissue. All right, okay, during the driest months, some de desert plants lose their leaves or just go dormant, okay? Others like cacti subsist on water stored in their fleshy stems during the rainy seasons, okay? Some plants use a special method of absorbing CO2 through their stomates, okay? And in most C4 plants, the water evaporating part of photosynthesis is separated from the carbon dioxide absorbing part, okay? And that's why they've been nicknamed the light and dark reactions of photosynthesis, which you'll learn about in bio 20 in the first couple of days. Okay. Um, the light reactions are the ones that uh, usually involve the separation of carbon dioxide and the dark reactions involve the evaporation of water. So. Yeah, basically, I mean, plants around here would generally be considered zero fights because we have a pretty long, you know, kind of hot dry season. I mean, that's not really dry, but it's drier. We live on the prairie. That's a relatively arid climate compared to others. Right? Like if you go into BC, it's quite a bit more more wet there. Okay, so that's what we had to cover for today. Takes us to pretty much the end here. We got ten more minutes. So um, if you got your phones there, you can work a little bit on your lab. If you got any questions about the lab, we can talk about those. Uh, I think I made it due on Monday, did I not? 
Or is it is it Friday? Okay, I'll have a look.